Hello, Good and welcome to the special RSA conference virtual session on the five most dangerous new attacks, the rest of the story. I'm your host, Erica Shubin of RSA Conference. During this session, all participants will be in listen-only mode. At the close of the presentation, we will conduct a question and answer session. Throughout the presentation, if you have a question, please use the chat feature, which is located in the lower left corner of your screen. If you are a GX certification holder, you are eligible to earn credit for attending this virtual session. Near the end of this session, take a screenshot of one of the final slides and submit the screenshot along with a brief written description of the session directly on your GX certification renewal portal. As a reminder, this session is being recorded. Following the session, you will receive a follow-up email containing a link to the video replay. The replay will also be posted to rsaconference.com. I would now like to turn it over to Research Director and Founder of SANS Institute, Alan Haller. Thank you, Erica. Uh, welcome, everyone. This is a fun session because it answers a whole bunch of the questions that didn't get answered at the keynote at the RSA conference in San Francisco. So we answered dozens of questions, and we had hundreds more. We still have the list from there but your questions will take priority over their questions because you're on the line. So um, as each speaker speaks, please enter a question in the chat group, but preface it with the person's name. So Ed will be the first uh, speaker. Johannes will be the second speaker. You can just use uh, J-O for Johannes. And James will be the third speaker. You can just write J-A for him so that we know to whom to ask the question. Um, with that, uh, a, quick, a quick review of, of what we're trying to do. These are the three people who, when something really strange or bad is happening on the Internet, someone in power or someone in the press calls them up and says, what's actually happening? And for the last 10 years, because they're on top of the things that are happening, they have done a session on what they anticipate as the most dangerous new attack vectors during the year. Some are ones that have not been seen. Some are just emerging. But they've been sort of unpleasantly accurate every year. And when you hear the first speaker, Ed Scotus, you'll probably react with a, that's not what I expected. But I've found that when Ed says that's going to be a new major attack vector, it's always a new major attack vector. So Ed Scotus is the most experienced teacher of uh, penetration testing and hacker exploits in the world. He's trained 30,000 people over the years in all the major intelligence agencies. He also is a person who gets called in after many of the major attacks to figure out what actually went wrong and then help the companies and law enforcement and government come up with a way to avoid it in the future. So Ed, if you don't mind, oh, he's also the person who built NetWars that m many of you use all the time to keep your skills up. So with that, Ed, you're first. Take it over from here. Thank you, Alan. I appreciate your kind introduction. Uh, there are two specific areas I want to draw people's attention to in the evolution of the attacks. And uh, as, as Alan just uh, mentioned, this is a big change. Um, one of the big areas that I'm increasingly getting called into investigating on the cases where I work, on the incidents that I handle, and frankly, even the techniques we use in our penetration testing are based on what you see on this slide. That is repositories for code and cloud storage leaking. The idea here is we build software in a very different way today than we did five years ago and certainly than we built it 10 or even 15 years ago. We're using cloud-based collaboration, things like Slack channels to coordinate among the developers, things like Git repositories to coordinate the uh, uh, committing of code and the analysis of code and the building of our applications. And we're using applications that store their data in the cloud. You know, things like Amazon S3 buckets or the Google Cloud Platform with its database or Microsoft Azure with cloud-based SQL Server. There's a whole bunch of different things here. We're using Docker to host images, GitHub to coordinate all this stuff. And I'm increasingly seeing breaches that are based on people getting access to these cloud-based assets. Sometimes we'll have a private repository of code that gets accidentally marked as public, or we'll have some code that actually gets put in the wrong repository, maybe one that's public. 
One of the big ones here is an Amazon S3 bucket that doesn't have proper access control configured in it. That's been a huge issue for the last 18 months, many major breaches. Back in October 2016, uh, Uber had exposed 57 million customer records and 7 million driver records uh, via uh, uh, one of these Amazon buckets. Or if you fast forward a little bit, uh, in September 2017, it was revealed that the U.S. Army had shared 100 gigabytes of sensitive military secrets by putting it in an improperly secured Amazon bucket. It's happened to Verizon, Time Warner. Even a company owned by FedEx has been exposed this way. Now, sometimes when code gets put into the wrong repository, the code will include things like encryption keys or passwords for accessing databases also in the cloud. So this is really a scary and bad thing. I'd like to talk about different ways you might be able to deal with this. So what can you do? It is critical that you have a data asset inventory. If you look at the, the top critical controls from the Center for Internet Security, they talk about having an asset inventory. And most people, when they build their asset inventory, are focused on the computing assets. That is, where are my desktops? Where are my servers? But increasingly, the computing assets don't belong to you. They're actually in the cloud. And they're in a geographic location you might not even know. Instead, you need to increase your asset understanding so that you have an inventory of your data assets. I urge you in your organizations to make sure that you have a data curator, someone whose job it is to maintain your asset inventory of data assets. Where are they? Where are our code repositories? Where are our cloud-based data repositories? And then you need to educate architects and developers to interact with that data curator so you can keep that asset inventory up to date and secure. You also need to prevent developers from committing code to private repositories or especially public repositories that has secrets in it, things like encryption keys or passwords. And there's a couple of free tools that help implement this. There's one called Get Secret, and another one with a very similar name is called Get Secret. Both of these tools can be used by developers, and what they'll do is if a developer tries to commit some code with what appears to be a password or a crypto key in it, it will flag it and not allow that commit. There's also a tool called Git Rob. This is useful for vulnerability assessment people. It's useful for penetration testers and, and also general security practitioners. This thing will go through various public Git repositories looking for sensitive information. Also, there's some really fascinating developments happening here with respect to AI and securing data in the cloud. Each one of your major cloud-based providers has introduced an AI service that you pay for, but it's really interesting stuff. Consider Amazon Macy, M-A-C-I-E, that's what it's called. What this is, is it's a subscription service for Amazon S3 buckets. You subscribe to this, and it will crawl through all the data that you have in your buckets. It will then automatically, using AI, tell you what it thinks is your most sensitive data and then make recommendations for how you can properly secure it. Microsoft has something called their Azure SQL Threat Detection. This AI, which again you pay for, will go through and look at the configuration of your Microsoft Azure SQL Server instances and tell you whether they're properly hardened. It will also look for attack patterns against that. So these cloud providers are enlisting AI to help find the sensitive data, to help identify if it's properly protected, and then to help, well, see if it's being attacked. Also, Google has something that they call their Google Cloud Data Loss Prevention API. This is an API that your developers can hook into and call, and it will identify over 70 different kinds of personally identifiable information using various patterns and AI recognition. It's also vital that you review the access logs associated with your data access. This is so critical. You want to see if your data is being accessed from unusual places. You want to double check and review the access control. All of those breaches I mentioned earlier associated with the Amazon S3 buckets. It's not a bug in Amazon's S3 implementation. Instead, it's simply people misconfiguring it. So you've got to make sure you configure it right. That was the first of two big trends I wanted to illustrate. The second one is based on big data and de-anonymization, also correlation across multiple different data sources. You see, I've spent much of the last 20 years of my career figuring out ways to get shell on a target system. And by shell, I mean you get an interactive command line on a target machine. That's how you often will hack into a system. 
I've dedicated much of my life to doing that myself and to teaching other people how to do that as professional penetration testers. But as I'm looking at the cases that I'm increasingly dealing with, I realize it's not just about hacking the machines. It's hacking the data. And by that, I don't mean just hacking to get the data. No, it's taking the data itself, exfiltrating it, but then doing analytics of that data and doing analytics across multiple data sets to do very detailed analysis. Disparate sources of information with correlation can allow us to do something called de-anonymization. And one of the, the prime examples of de-anonymization actually comes from the Netflix prize. Uh, over the last 10 years or so, Netflix has offered a prize to whomever can come up with the cleverest algorithm for deciding what movies you like based on what movies you've already liked. That's pretty cool. What they're looking to see is if you can create a better algorithm than Netflix already has so that they can improve their algorithm. So Netflix posted some anonymous Netflix data. It was anonymized so that you couldn't see that user Sally had watched movie X, Y, and Z. No, you couldn't see that at all. You didn't know who Sally was. Instead, it would just say user ABC123, just an anonymized source watched movie X, Y, and Z. Some researchers took that anonymized data from Netflix, and then they took another separate disparate data source. They took the IMDb database. And on IMDb, there's various users who are rating movies, and there's a date stamp of when they rated the movies. So what they would do is they would do a de-anonymization step with some statistical analysis to determine, hey, user ABC123 watched movie X, Y, and Z. Also, around the same time, there was a user in IMDb who did a movie review of movie X and movie Z and liked those movies, just like user ABC123. But in IMDb, we've got a de-anonymized data source. It turns out it was Sally. We could do that analysis and cross-correlation and determine that Sally must have watched the movie Y as well because we learned that from the Netflix data. So you line things up based on what's in the IMDb data so that you can then make extrapolations from that and determine other movies that Sally watched. And they might say, what's the big deal? It's just watching movies. It's possible that some of those movies might have some implications, and Sally wants to maintain her privacy of what movies she's watched. There could be political things or, or other things associated with Sally's life that she doesn't want people to know which movies she's watching. And that is merely associated with the data of movies that you're watching. If you look at what happened with Cambridge Analytica and their detailed analysis and, and trending of Facebook data, you can see how hacking the data itself is like the big, big emerging thing. And sometimes I think about how, you know, I do penetration tests so that we can get shell on target boxes. Maybe, maybe I'm like that proverbial general trying to fight the last war. Maybe the war is no longer about getting shell, but the war is about how do we, how do, how do bad guys hack our data? and do de-anonymization. But then as I think about this myself, I think a little bit, maybe, maybe it's, it's not a new war. No, no, it's a new front in the same war. Because of course you still have to hack into the target machine so you can exfiltrate the data, but then the new front is actually doing the analytics of that data. So what can you do? You need to be extremely careful about exposing data, even if it seems innocuous or even anonymized. And if you get breached, when you look at that breached data, you might say, well, they never got the username or they never got the account number but they might be able to get that from other sources. So you need to think expansively as you look at what your risk exposure is here for data that gets stolen from your organization. Consider how your data could be used with others' data to undermine your mission. And as a security professional, one of the best ways you could start thinking about data in terms of data itself is to learn more about open source intelligence. Now, every year my team releases something we call the Holiday Hack Challenge. It's the SANS Holiday Hack Challenge. And the 2017 Holiday Hack Challenge, we actually put a free challenge on the Internet so that you can get into the North Pole and get into Santa's naughty and nice list. But Santa's naughty and nice list is anonymized. However, we also give you access to the North Pole Police Department's data feed. And you can do de-anonymization there. We wanted to, to teach a lesson by having a free public challenge associated with de-anonymization of Santa's naughty and nice list. So those are two big data-centric trends that I'm seeing in the attacks that I have to deal with. So let me turn it back over to either Johannes or Alan, whoever uh, wants to, to take the mic. It's all yours. I'll do a real quick uh, introduction. So the, I have some questions for Ed already, but I'm, I'm not seeing very many coming from the audience. If you know everything you need to know about web, web security, you should be one of the speakers at the upcoming 
uh, what's it called, the Cloud Insecurity Conference coming up. Because what Ed's talking about are two of the ten most damaging mistakes that users are making that they don't know they're making. So ask questions about that stuff because it, it, if you're getting anywhere near the cloud, doing that wrong means all sorts of your information is in the wrong hands because people are scanning it all the time. With that, we're going to move to Johannes Ulrich. For those of you who listen to his, the 15,000 of you who listen to his podcast every morning, you know who he is. He runs the Internet Storm Center, which is a 24 by 7 program monitoring new bad things that are happening on the Internet. He also teaches some of our most advanced courses. So Johannes, your turn. Thank you very much for the introduction, Al. So what I'll be talking about is a little bit of continuation of what I talked about last year. Last year when I was talking at RSA, one of the big topics was ransomware. And what we realized back then was that attackers aren't really necessarily interested in your data anymore. Instead, uh, what they're doing is they're taking your data and selling it back to you instead of selling it on the black market. <coughs> Now, uh, what you have seen this year happening is sort of where they continue that trend where data really becomes less and less valuable to the attacker, not necessarily to you, but to the attacker because it all has already been stolen. So not too much money to be made by just selling it. Instead, what they're now doing is they're actually using your CPU power, something that they really sort of had no way of reselling or really monetizing in the Johannes, so, are you still there? Uh, yes, I'm still here. Sorry, still here. Lost you a little bit. Yeah. Um, so what we saw really uh, this year is that attackers focused on CPU power. What this means is, and it really sort of became very obvious sort of around uh, January, February, we looked at a breach of a number of uh, PeopleSoft servers. Now, PeopleSoft, uh, by all definitions, is sort of a company's crown jewels. That's where your most popular data lives. But what really happened was that at Hackers, they didn't touch the data. Instead, they used these systems for crypto coin mining. And what you see here is something one of our Storm Center handlers, Renato Marino, uh, put together. Uh, these are about a thousand plus servers uh, that he identified, all of them housing really valuable data, but they were used for crypto coin mining. So why? Well, it uh, turns out there's real money to be made. This was one particular um, miner or miner group that we looked at, and they made about $150,000. Now, Monero, the currency they mined, I think has lost a little bit. It's luster by now, but still, you were talking tens of thousands of dollars that can be made uh, using these crypto coin miners. And uh, that's really where a lot of uh, this, the action is right now. Now, how do you defend against this? Well, uh, there are some obvious signals. For example, high CPU load and then network traffic where the attacker would try to exfiltrate the data and would like to connect to these mining pools that help them actually get credit for the work they're doing. So this is something that you can detect remotely. <coughs> so and then an other indicator, and that's not always that easy to detect remotely, high temperatures of on the systems. And one particular part of this threat is actually an insider threat that um, we have seen where an insider is not necessarily just installing a mining software. You would be able to detect that easily. But where an insider is actually bringing in mining equipment and then hooking it up to the company's power and network. Worst case I've seen here was where a mining rig was actually hidden underneath a raised data center floor. And that, of course, then caused cooling issues within the data center. We also increasingly see these attackers going against each other, where they're sort of trying to steal each other's mining equipment. Now, just before I got on this call, we actually were looking at uh, yet another event here. Uh, looks like it was some Monero miner. Sometimes, well, you know, people that, that dabble in cryptocurrencies, they're used to some of these irrational risks. So they don't see anything wrong with uh, running a miner with an API without authentication, expo 
exposed to the internet. And this was, I believe, the case we just started to look in earlier today, where sort of these miners are being taken over. But, uh, well, uh, then we have another threat that really sort of became big last year and is still developing, and that's, well, water beliefs in hardware. I'm a developer, and the one thing I always trust is hardware. I trust that if I write my code correctly, which may be a stretch, but sometimes happens, that the hardware actually does what I instructed to do. And I also rely on hardware to sort of you know, keep my process separate from other processes running on the same system. Well, uh, that assumption is actually very much flawed and false and never really has been true. I went back here and found uh, issues like you know, all the way back to the 60s with magnetic core memory where they had an effect called worst case noise. What this means is that you access the memory using certain patterns. You actually flip unrelated bits. Well, that's exactly what came back with Rowhammer. And then, of course, you know, last year we had Spectre and Meltdown. I just added Spectre and G here, which are these new flaws that are coming up. Haven't really fully been released yet, uh, but uh, yes, look, this list of flaws isn't going to end anytime soon. And really, it's based on the basic problems we always have with security versus performance versus features, where if you're trying to do things uh, too optimized, uh, too specific, too fast, well, uh, security sometimes is shortchanged. We had the same problem in compilers. In compilers, sometimes optimization of the compiler sort of you know, removes essentially security features and makes software less secure. As a result, in compilers, we have switches where we can turn off certain features, certain optimization features. Maybe we need something like this for CPUs, where we can tell the CPU, hey, if you're running this highly security relevant code. Well, uh, don't use some of the features that make this code run faster, which may lead to less secure code. Now, how do you protect yourself from this kind of threat? Now, this is really hard. Eh? Uh, because who do you trust? If you can't trust hardware anymore, what do you do? Well. Uh, once you stop trusting hardware, you stop using hardware to actually keep privileges separate. So yes, you know, insist for some of these critical processes on physically isolated hardware. And physically isolated doesn't mean a core within a larger CPU. It actually means hardware that has no other processes running on it that could possibly interfere. And then of course, you know, encrypt not just uh, when you transmit data across the network, but also encrypt data at rest. What I uh, call this here is encrypt data on the wire. That's sort of now what we often say when we are referring to encrypting data on the network. But really, your CPU, it's a lot of wires. So some of the same threats really apply here. So why not apply some of the same protections and keep your data encrypted as much as possible, even at rest? And uh, with that, uh, I'll hand it over back to Alan and uh, with that uh, to James. Thank you, Johannes. Um, keep these questions coming in. They're great. If uh, the, That was Johannes. So if you're asking Johannes a question, just put J-O or Johannes in front of the question so we know it's for him and not for Ed. Um, our third speaker traditionally was um, Mike Asante, who is the world's foremost expert on attacks on industrial control systems. He was the Chief Security Officer of American Electric Power, a Chief Security Officer for the North American Electric Reliability Corporation. He's sort of done it all, and he's really wonderful. He is in the fight of his life, um, fighting cancer right now, and he didn't feel good enough to do today, or the, and he couldn't come to the San Francisco one. Um, so James Lyme step, stepped in. James is the head of research and development for SANS in Europe. He is the go-to person for, uh, for government intelligence agencies uh, all the time. He's, uh, he, he has security software that right now I think is running on 150 million computers. He knows a lot and he does a great job of channeling, um, channeling Mike Asante. The other thing that James did is he broke the code on finding talented people who will excel in cybersecurity even if they don't know they will. 
He did it with the British government, and it's fascinating. If, you, if you've if been looking at how do we find the next generation of cybersecurity people, James' work has posted, I think it's called cyberstart.us, and it's fascinating stuff. So with that, James, you're on. Thank you very much, Alan. Well, a pleasure to be here, and um, I'm, I'm not going to reiterate everything that I covered in the, uh, in, in the main session in, in the keynote, uh, as that is available for, uh, for everyone to, to view. Um, allow me, if you, if you will, ladies and gentlemen, a, a brief regression of covering a small portion of, um, uh, of the material that, uh, that I covered there, just to set context. Then I'd like to, to add a little bit of depth to, uh, to, to a few of the things that I said and clarify some of the things that we see happening at the moment. Um, now, I, I spent a lot of time uh, working with, with Mike Asante uh, on, on this kind of area of industrial control compromise. And traditionally, it's not the area that I've been explicitly focused. But what's really interesting is that the area of industrial control and SCADA and, and connected devices, I suppose in general, has been coalescing with, with mainstream security in some really interesting ways. I spend most of my time looking at mainstream malicious code, uh, uh, mainstream exploits in the technology that the majority of us focus on using day-to-day -day in enterprises and consumers. I think one of the things that first kind of kicked me into being more concerned about this area as an attack trend, even before my extensive discussions with, with Mike and learning some of the truth of what's, what's going on in that domain, was during a perusal of, uh, of, of a dark website, uh, a, time, a place where I spend a lot of my time, and you know, amidst the attacks offering to take down small businesses with distributed denial of service, offering to steal credit cards or sell existing stolen data, ostensibly attacks focused on fraud, I found a surprising volume of um, a kind of cyber criminals moving into less fraud motivated attacks. And one stunning example um, was a particular gang offering the services to work on compromise of industrial control systems, a domain that has really application mostly in, in military or intelligence in potentially impacting life and limb or developing a future capability to, to disable an adversary. And that was shocking to me because whilst this stuff I know happens and I've looked at examples before, I'd never before seen a, a shift into mainstream cyber criminals offering these types of, these types of services, if you will. Um, so that, that really caused me to do a lot of comparison of ICS and SCADA with the world that I, I know and love day to day and, and to dive into this with, with, with Mike. I also found a really interesting um, kind of point of parity early on. Over the last few years, I've been running a project to rip apart Internet of Things devices, um, all kinds of strange devices from kind of hairbrushes to cameras to the, well, the sublime to the ridiculous, I suppose we should say, uh, even up to and including uh, cars, by the way, great to see some, some questions coming in as we go. Uh, make sure you use that question tab. And um, I, uh, I found that lots of the, the devices, these consumer and SME devices I was looking at, actually share some terrifying threat model with some of the industrial control and, and big scary devices uh, that we're going to talk about now. So I found there was, there was more in comparison in threat model than, than I was expecting. Um, I, I briefly want to to touch on this example of Triton or Trisys. And I won't reiterate everything I said about this at the conference, but for those of you that are unfamiliar with it, it's a fascinating example that's worth reading up on and examining in depth, whether you're in the ICS space or not. This is a piece of malware that targets Snyder Electronics Triconics Safety Instrumented System, which is easy for me to say, uh, the SIS. And the SIS, for those of you unfamiliar with the role, is, is basically a little part of, of an industrial control uh, process overall, but typically sits in the bottom right-hand corner, isolated from the, the rest of the services, from the DCS and, and all the, um, the, the kind of programming interfaces and controls themselves. The goal of it is to provide the last resort correction in the event that the system and that that it controls starts to move out of safe 
parameters. So if you've got something that, you know, if it increases to a certain speed or a certain voltage or power, a certain pressure, the SIS is that safeguard that brings it back to normal operating procedures or which safely shuts it down to prevent catastrophic damage. Of course, that's a really important role when you consider what some of these systems are, are fundamentally doing. Factories staffed with people you know, working in close proximity to large infrastructure where life and limb impact is a very real possibility. So here we have a piece of malware that's targeted the SIS. What we've seen over the past few years is a movement of design of industrial control systems more towards mainstream computing and, and network connectivity. SIS systems are being connected in rather than isolated out uh, to the rest of the, uh, the rest of the industrial control process. Now, each of these SISs is, is kind of unique in their implementation. Um, so there's a lot of work involved with, with tailoring these attacks. This particular example is, is really interesting, A, because it targets a safety system, which has interesting motive ramifications that we'll talk about in a moment. B, though, um, because it's actually something that's widely publicized and available. You can look at a large portion of the code. Uh, this was actually uh, inadvertently or maybe purposely uploaded to Virus Total, uh, where the, uh, the code for a substantial portion of the campaign became available to a large number of parties. Uh, and this is actually, again, a piece of malicious code that has been used against at least one victim. Now, the attack itself isn't kind of highly scalable, instant repeatable. Um, you can't take that, that published code and just go after all the SISs and start exploiting left, right, and center. It's a tad different to firing up Metasploit and using something like Eternal Blue. However, it does provide a, a pattern uh, that other actors could, could copy and, and modify. Uh, you could take the husk of that attack produce new shell code and go after different SIS systems. But the reason I want to bring up this example in particular as, a, as an interesting attack trend is really the motives. These SIS systems versus other more obvious places that the attackers could go and, and uh, apply their code to the controllers themselves or even, as we'll discuss shortly, the sensors, is that last line of defense from preventing physical damage. Now, this malware went after the system that could actually prevent that from happening. Well, reflect on that for a moment. Let that, let that sink in. Here we have an actor where the very clear motive is to be able to do substantial physical damage, life and limb impact from the digital world. I do think to expand upon what I described during the uh, keynote, a really interesting aspect, I know this is something Mike's very, very curious about as well, is where's the, the big brother or big sister to this campaign? We have a piece of malware that has the ability to prevent the safety system from kicking in and could enable life and limb impacts. But where's the piece of malware that sits focused on the main controllers on, on the rest of the process to actually do that damage? Um, the, uh, the kind of reality is it's unlikely this actor was waiting for the, uh, for the kind of system to move outside of normal parameters uh, and, then, and then fail to catch it. But maybe that was the game plan. But nonetheless, I think this is a really interesting example of increased use of um, our kind of our attack models and technology to go after something other than the mainstream computing world. I think we're going to see a lot more of it given that espionage and building military capability has always been something that countries do, I think, um, I think it's kind of inevitable that the use of cyber and, and use of more, more of these attacks uh, is, is going to be a trend of the coming years. Um, and with that, I thought it was really interesting to have a quick look at the, um, the maturity of protection that exists on these systems versus the mainstream computing world. Um, it does seem there's a little bit of, uh, of text wrap on the slide, but rest assured, I'll, uh, I'll go through it. In the mainstream computing world, there's been some incredible systematic improvement of the kind of resilience of computers. We've seen the likes of Microsoft and, and other OS manufacturers and app builders 
do work like building mitigation, like safe structure, exception handling, data execution, prevention, address space, layout randomization, um, force ASLR, really a, a kind of set of nets designed to catch attackers when code does something that it shouldn't. And there are so many more of these application-specific examples. Uh, if we look at web browsers like Internet Explorer or Edge now, uh, that's been repeatedly pounded upon by exploit writers and cyber criminals. And as a result of that, we have things like the isolated heap. We have kind of VT guard and kind of V table point protection and all kinds of clever mechanisms designed to separate out high risk DOM objects uh, when we're dealing with JavaScript or dealing with action script uh, from the runnings of the application. I mean, I used to be one of the people that would kind of jump up and down and say how Microsoft and others were people that created this whole industry uh, through these types of vulnerabilities. But some of these mitigations are, are truly impressive and in that they've been deployed to thousands and thousands of people around the world. Well, millions of people, I should say, I suppose, just a very large number of those thousands, <laughs> um, without anyone really knowing this was happening. So there's so much here that means the average bug in code on a mainstream computing device is far less likely to actually be exploitable. In the ICS SCAR domain, I'd say they're kind of 15 years behind the mainstream computing world. I mean, we have contractually or very operationally restrictive patching cycles where things kind of stay on very archaic platforms for an extended period of time. Uh, I've seen Windows 95 running on VxWorks, uh, running huge robots uh, that do really important kind of multi-million uh, manufacturing processes. Um, there's a frequent reliance on obscurity of protocols or isolation as opposed to um, as opposed to kind of building more resilient protocols against attack. There's tons of real mode um, where we don't have kind of good division of memory into different protection levels. It, it's just fundamentally far less protected. And for, for direct comparison, only in the last couple of years of features like safe structured exception handling and depth, things that have been in Microsoft's operating system since XP SP2 are making the way into, uh, into these types of devices and into controllers. So they just aren't set up to be exposed and attacked in the way the mainstream computing world is. They haven't been forged in the fires of the focus of cyber criminals of the past 10 years. Consider that alongside how these are being networked much more openly, even connected to the internet to enable remote administration. And I think we have a very concerning trend. I don't think the agility of, uh, of fixes in this ICS SCADA domain uh, is set up to be in parity with the, uh, the level of focus that it's going to get from cyber criminals over the next few years. Just a couple more points I want to make here before we wrap out to, uh, to questions. One kind of other trend of, um, of where I think uh, cyber criminals will focus their efforts. If you look at a very high level um, view of, of an industrial control process and the different components, from the HMI where operators are going and making their changes through to the, the PLC themselves. We've seen lots of examples of people going after these first, these first two tiers, the HMI or down to the, essentially to the PLC, um, using protocols like RDP, doing RDP man in the middle, social engineering operators, using USD to drop code. What I think is really scary and where Mike and I get concerned is this shift down to the sensors. These sensors are our ultimate source of truth, and they're growing in number, they're growing in complexity, they're running, in many cases, little mini operating systems themselves with a great deal more functionality. How do we deal with a world where it's not just our controller centrally, one, one place that's being attacked with malicious code, what happens when our sources of truth, the sensors, are compromised and lies are being told up to our central system? I think that's a really terrifying and obvious expansion domain for the cyber criminals and a very difficult problem for security within an ecosystem where already we're so far behind the curve of the mainstream computing world. So uh, let me kind of start to, to draw to a, a close here. Um, 
I think we have to accept that, you know, the, the, the kind of focus of military and intelligence operations beyond profit, nation state actors and more, is undeniably going to create more and more focus on this domain in parallel with us connecting these systems more and deploying them more throughout everything from, you know, the, the power grid to smart cities, even down to the more consumer oriented versions with ICS and, and IoT, um, where there is, I think, a lot of opportunity for these attackers as well. I think there are lots of lessons for us to learn from the mainstream computing world to apply to this domain, like these mitigations, and that we need to do that work aggressively now rather than fighting rearguard action um, as attackers invariably step up here. I think we need to be on the lookout for more of, of these types of attacks, but also new breeds like poisoning at the level of the sensors, which should be exponentially more difficult to detect than going after those controllers. And last but not least, I think we should be asking the question, with attackers going after the likes of, of SIS, the, the, the safety systems, is there a bigger brother attack out there that we have yet to see uh, that goes hand in hand with it to create that catastrophic failure? Is this perhaps an example of an adversary testing their capabilities, building a future bastion that they could use to exercise if they needed in a military scenario where the other part of the attack is on the shelf or we just haven't seen it yet in the broader community. I hope that's not too scary. I think it is a very serious issue that we really have to focus on. And on the plus side, I think we've got a lovely roadmap from the challenges many of us have faced in the mainstream computing world on what we can do to make these things better. And with that, I will uh, hand back to Alan, because I know we on that have questions. Thanks, Hello. James. On that happy note, I'm going to ask you a, a lighter question in a minute, but I want to go to Ed first. But the lighter question, just so you can be ready, is about a Ford Focus with it's powered by Microsoft and how you protect yourself from the out-of-date software. But I want to go back to Ed. Ed, you came you, you said our inventory should include um, uh, data. And this question from Jacob says, how do you think companies will adapt to GDPR to protect their data? Ah, Is that I, I related to what you were talking uh, about? It, it, it is because um, essentially uh, the European nations have kind of lit a fire underneath our behinds. Uh, to say, hey, this data is sensitive if it's associated with European citizens and needs to be protected. So this is the, the general uh, data privacy regulation, GDPR. And, um, and organizations right now need to start complying immediately. The deadline's coming up in just uh, about a week or two. Um, and you're going to have to go through and figure out where your data is if, if you do any business in Europe and have any data associated with European citizens. Um, so you're going to need to, to find that. And this is a great opportunity for you to apply this concept of the data asset inventory and having a data curator. You probably have somebody in your organization right now that is going through all of your data to make sure it's compliant with these new regulations. Great. What an impetus to create your, your data asset inventory. Cool. All right. Um, let, let me go back to James and do the Taurus question. So it's, um, I own my Ford, not Taurus, Focus. My Ford Focus says it's powered by Microsoft, but it's obvious it hasn't been patched in years. What protections are even available to me? Well, and, and, and this is exemplary of the issue of, of this entire domain. Um, most of the time, and I, uh, I, I haven't looked at the specific ecosystem of, of your Ford Focus, but if you'd like to donate it to my cause for me, me to be able to do some more reverse engineering, I'd, I'd be very happy. Um, <laughs> but one of the challenges here is you're dealing often with a, a black box product. Whether it's a car or an Internet of Things connected kettle or coffee machine, you don't really have very often much ability to get in there and, and trigger these types of actions. With some of these devices that connect to a network, Network security controls uh, can be applied. Isolation can be applied. If it's an Internet of Things connected fridge, I can at least connect it to a separate SSID that's separated from my computer and all the good stuff attackers may want to get to. With something like a car, it's really tough. We really have to put pressure on the manufacturers, on the regulators, and of course, as security researchers, do our part in finding flaws 
to make this better for consumers, and they don't really have a path to pragmatic protections. All they can do is follow the best practice of doing updates and doing their part when they're available. And if they aren't, you know, your Ford Focus might be a little Yep. yep. Um, Johannes, I've got a bunch of crypto questions for you, but there's a, one following up on James' answer. He talked about isolation, and it, it, the question is, um, is there a way to isolate systems by building your own Internet or subnetting or something that actually is protective? Well, the problem with building your own Internet is that a large part of the value that you gain from the Internet is that everybody is connected to it. So by building your own Internet, you really reduce a lot of the value that you gain from actually being connected. And uh, with that, it's really, really hard to actually remain or to stay uh, disconnected from the Internet. Uh, that's the old sort of air gap um, discussion, and I believe uh, actually last year Ed was talking about that, that whenever you talk about air gap, you're really just talking about a high latency link. So this discussion about separate internets usually don't go very far and don't solve the actual problem we have is that we would like to talk to the, the world, be connected to the world in a secure manner. Could you, the, the way I heard it yesterday, people were worried about Emerson Electric has these uh, IoT devices in rich people's houses, um, and apparently it's a great, potentially a great backdoor, just the way the heating and ventilating and uh, heating and ventilating system was in Target. So, is there a way to isolate your IoT devices in a network if you're a corporation or even a big home? Is that a safety strategy, or is that that's, that doesn't have the same problem with lack of connectivity? I guess. Well, um, so network segmentation is certainly, you know, one strategy that you can apply that makes these networks easier to protect. But you know, then you have these very controlled uplinks, uh, sometimes even data diodes that only allow sort of one-way connections uh, to the rest of the network, and that certainly, you know, can work. Great. Back to James. Hey, um, this one's about the the U.S. and the Ukraine. Uh, Somebody heard Mike talk, and he said that had the, the attack that took out power across big swaths of the Ukraine hit um, the United States, it would have done much more damage because we're much more automated, and we didn't have any of the manual systems still in place. If that's true, what strategy is there for protecting against these kinds of attacks on 15-year-old systems? Well, well, well that, that's right, isn't it? I mean, automation... Um, always comes with the, the benefit of being able to do more regular checks, um, being able to, to collect more data centrally, um, but it also comes with the price that you potentially become a much bigger target and there can be a larger cascade failure of, of a system. That, that applies in general um, to, to any architectural infrastructure that, that we create. Um, I think, you know, respecting the, the level of maturity of exploit mitigations here, um, the increasing interest in targeting um, these, these technologies, and the life and limb catastrophic impacts, it's really important that we don't forget uh, the value of isolated safety systems, physical processes and shutdowns, checks and balances of people. I mean, there are lots of business process things that can happen here alongside technology to help in introduce safeguards against the worst case scenario. Uh, and all of those should be used. Um, and actually, in, in my experience, in many of these, um, they, they, do tend to be, uh, they do tend to be there, making these attacks quite complicated to execute. Even with the, uh, the example we talked through, there was a switch um, that prevented the, uh, the device from being modified during its running use, um, a physical switch that, that changes it from being reprogrammable to, to not. Of course, these things can see failure, but building up those layers helps avoid the scenario you're describing. I think we need to strongly focus on using those in anger and validating them, um, whilst in parallel working on earning the right to use greater automation by building more resilient technologies here with more of a standing of, of, of attack prevention that we'd expect from the mainstream computing world or more. Cool. Thank you, James. Uh, back to Ed. 
uh, this one says we've we've moved a lot of our applications to cloud instances. How would you do mm -hmm. penetration testing in that environment? Ah, uh, there's a lot of different options. Uh, one of the most straightforward options is to get the permission of the cloud provider to do penetration testing of the application. Some cloud providers uh, will forbid it just outright. Others, um, you fill out a form. In fact, if you look at like Amazon, AWS, uh, or Google Compute, uh, you can get permission from them by filling out a form. And their, their main focus is making sure you're not going to hurt other tenants of the cloud. They, are, they will ask you the details of what you're going to do in such a pen test. And uh, if you describe it appropriately, you'll be able to get permission to do so. Um, but sometimes you can't. Sometimes the cloud provider will just say no. What I would do then, if you really have a compliance requirement or something that insists that you get a pen test done, is you have to push the cloud provider to say, if you won't let me do a pen test, and I must get one done, then you, cloud provider, have to get one done and show me the evidence that it was done, like a summary of the report. Uh, so sometimes I review those summaries of those reports that the cloud providers get from their own pen test companies. And then a final thing that you could do is actually pen test through the cloud, not the cloud as the target, but usually you have client systems that are inside the organization, and they're accessing resources on the cloud. And you could do a client-side pen test of those client systems without actually touching the cloud systems. Once you get onto those client systems, you can then look at their actions on the cloud, again, without hacking the cloud. So those are three different approaches. Do the pen test with permission. Make sure that if you can't get permission, that the cloud provider does the pen test. And the other thing is to go through the clients. Cool. Um, Johannes, on, on crypto, how do they avoid being detected? And well, let's just start with that one. I got a couple. How do they keep from being detected, or do they always get detected? No, they don't get always detected. Uh, now, one way we have seen lately how they avoid getting detected is by just not taking all the resources. So what they're doing is that they have a parameter set uh, in their crypto mining software. They would, they'll never have the CPU load uh, spike beyond a certain limit. And that, of course, now removes the one detection scenario where you're looking at high CPU load. Now, the other detection method, we're looking at the network traffic. Uh, these uh, crypto coin miner pools, well, uh, there are block lists you can download for the well-known crypto miner pool addresses. What they're now often doing is that the attacker is setting up its own sort of proxy for uh, these requests. That, of course, now is at some random IP address that's uh, possibly not blacklisted yet. There may not even be a DNS lookup uh, for it, or if there's a DNS lookup, it may just be some random Amazon cloud IP or so that's uh, being looked up here. So uh, this is how these crypto coin miners try to remain under the radar. What still works amazingly well is anti-malware. Now, there's a lot of bad that has been written and that I've written over the years about you know, where anti-malware fails. But amazingly, at this point, I don't see a lot of obfuscation of these miners. So many of them are actually still easily detectable with anti-malware. Gotcha. Um, James, I'm going to come back to you with this question. Somebody's asked, I, th I had said you broke the code on finding people who are talented in cybersecurity. They want to know what the code is. But I want to go back to um, Ed first and ask about uh, a question, come on, um, that I, has come up for years with the NSA, where it, what if the pen test isn't actually finding anything new? It's sort of just refinding all the low-hanging fruit. Is there a way to know whether your pen testers are any good? Sure. Um, what you could do is you can rotate the pen test organizations that you use. Um, I, I do think there's a value in having a long-term relationship with a pen tester where you have the same pen test group do pen tests periodically so you can see how you're changing over time. But if you're getting to sort of a, a happy medium and not finding any deltas or differences or significant things, um, get another pen test company in there. You know, maybe, maybe you get, I don't know, four or six pen tests a year. One or two of those uh, you might want to use a different company for so you can compare and contrast and then constantly sharpen your skills. Um, I, I think that's a really good approach. Is that really just a compare and contrast, or does it kind of generate a little competitive energy between them so you get better work? It does, it does that too. That's, uh, that's the, the cherry on top of the Sunday, I suppose. It, it does. And it, you know, steel sharpens steel, so it pushes them all to get better. 
And it's just trying to just get out of the complacency. And if you're seeing the same thing, do something different. And the easiest way to do that is with a different company. Now, you could scope it differently or do a different kind of pen test. You know, hey, you've been you know, focused on a network pen test. Well, let's have them do a web app pen test. They'll probably use different staff for that um, because each one has its uh, different focus. But uh, switching out the company to another high-quality company can have some good value. Nice. All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back to James on bro- breaking the code on finding talent. Um, but after that, I'm going to come back to each of you for uh, one minute. What's the biggest thing that you want to leave the audience with, one, one big idea? Um, and, and we'll just go around in the same order we started. So James, you want to do the – how do you find these people who, who have um, a natural talent for cybersecurity excellence? Yeah, so, so we approached this problem um, in uh, what I think was an interesting way. We took a large sample of successful security practitioners spanning different disciplines, um, looking at how people in forensics behave day to day, the types of work they do, uh, the pen test, defense, all, all these different areas. And we built up a set of skills that we need, things we've got to be able to do, and kind of ways that we, or traits, ways that we behave. Then we divided our approach into finding these people into two areas. We built one focused on younger adults, which I think is a large part of, of the solution, in particular looking at kind of 11 to 18-year-olds first, and another one focused on kind of 18 plus, where we looked at building aptitude profiles um, to, to test these traits. But, but let me focus on the, the former one, because I think it's more interesting. For each of the skills or traits, we abducted back from the complete thing that you would do as a security practitioner and tried to write a a, a slow step of each of the the kind of building blocks of logic that you require to be able to do that thing. So, So we'd write a kind of contrived crypto problem that would teach you about looking for structure in data. And then we wrap it all in gamification, and we built a huge gaming platform that makes it fun and engaging and accessible with a narrative of thwarting cyber criminals with points and levels and taking learning from from the wonderful world of gaming in general. And the the wonderful thing that happened as we played this out over the last few years is we've run national programs with thousands and thousands and thousands of young adults. As we found, it reduces the barrier so that people who don't know they have an interest can have a go, have some fun, and realize they're actually rock stars at the core set of skills that we need to turn them into security practitioners. They self-identify and float to the top, um, up to and including wonderful examples of being young adults who are studying completely unrelated subjects, uh, who never had an interest in cybersecurity. Uh, oh, okay, hey, James, all right. It, it is exciting. <laughs> <laughs> I don't okay, I want to give everybody one minute. Ed, your first or a half a minute, just what's the one idea you'd like the audience to take away from? James, you can come back to this one if you want on your half a minute. Absolutely. Ed. My my big thing I, I always like to leave people with is this, this idea of paying it forward. We have hundreds and hundreds of cybersecurity professionals <laughs> on this webcast listening now. Please volunteer at your local high school, local community college. Help develop the next group of individuals. I was just at a session last week where we had a couple hundred uh, teenage girls in Delaware. It's called DigiGirls, and we put together a little uh, capture the flag for them, uh, and we had, we had about 50 girls go through it. It was wonderful, so much fun, and we're hoping to, to help them develop their skills and get an interest in this kind of thing. And I, I challenge everybody here, everybody listening to this, to do something like that. Volunteer. Thank you. Johannes? Are you on mute, Johannes? All right, James. I'm sorry here. Uh, oh, so okay, I, go I ahead. I was just uh, with, uh, following up on Ed, you know, share, share what you see in networks, share with others, learn from others, don't make the same mistakes all over again, and don't underestimate the creativity of the attackers. Attackers always come up with new ways. On the final, final note, uh, don't be desperate. Uh, you will survive, uh, even though they will come up with new attacks. Uh, just uh, make sure that you look at what really are the high-risk attacks that you have to protect yourself against. And with that, to James, sorry. No problem. James, last word. I think, 
I think both of those are uh, are spot on. I feel like Ed actually took mine, given my long rant about finding finding <laughs> talent. Thanks for that, Ed. But uh, hey. <laughs> as, as a brief delta, um, I I would say we have to remind ourselves to think broadly about the types of targets that attackers want to pursue, their motives, and their readiness to withstand a new degree of focus. Not everything has experienced the 10, 15 years of pounding on by cyber criminals of the devices most of us have in front of us. And that gap is one we want to try and fix before it's too late. With that, I think we are done. I want to give the microphone back to Erica for some closing words. Yeah, thank you to our speakers for this excellent presentation, and thanks to all of you for joining us for this RSA conference virtual session. We hope you will join us in Singapore from July 25th to 27th for RSA Conference 2018 APJ. For more information and to register, please visit rsaconference.com. Thank you. You may now disconnect.